Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener in training, Tanisha Shade Spain. Now, good news, bad news. Unfortunately, we're able to take calls tonight, but the good news is we've got some great questions, topics, and show and tells to get to. So let's get started. We'll have our panelists introduce themselves. Our first one, Needs no introduction, really, but go ahead and tell them anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tanisha. And I must say, you're doing a fabulous job. I am so glad to be on this side of the table. <laughs> we weren't so going to let there. you get away. You're doing a great job. You're Thank doing a great you. job. Thank anyway, you. I'm Sandy Mason. I'm with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Gardener Coordinator. And so I deal with a little of everything, green and growing, and I'll try and help you out. All right. I'm Don White. I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology from the University of Illinois. While on the faculty at the University of Illinois, I taught introductory plant pathology, disease of field crops, and disease of ornamentals and turf grasses, and I did research on corn diseases, genetic resistance. After retirement, I got kind of bored, so <laughs> I became a master gardener, and it's been a it's been a lot of fun for me. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, get to meet an awful lot of nice people. It's something that a lot of you maybe ought to try. There's mm -hmm. training at different times during the year, depending on the county that you're in. Mm -hmm. So come on down. All right. That's Even right. online for folks like me who <laughs> yeah. can get in the That's classroom. Right. So, and last but not least, I'm Marianne Metz. Um, good evening, dear. I am a horticulturalist, landscape designer, and very importantly, a gardener. Yes. Um, like my friends here, we all love to garden. It's a, a great thing to be in. And um, I'm an inactive master gardener. But that's only because I'm still working full time as a uh, at Prairie Gardens in Champaign. Gotcha. So it uh, keeps me on my toes and keeps me in plants. And um, guys, I love plant people. Awesome. <laughs> All right, let's jump right in. So, Sandy, we're going to start with you. Sue Ellen sent in an email, and it reads <laughs> What the heck is this weed? I let it grow to see how tall it would get. It hasn't stopped and is now four foot. They keep popping up in my perennial gardens. Thank goodness they are ready to pull. So. What is Sue Ellen dealing with? Okay, Sue Ellen. Well, it didn't take long for me to find the exact same plant that she was asking about. <laughs> uh, so this is actually, I always call it mare's tail. Some people call it horseweed. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very common plant actually in roadsides, especially on un unmown roadsides, or if you have a, maybe a little bit of a wild area, you'll see these grow. They'll actually get up to six feet tall. So hers are wow. four feet that can get easily up to six feet tall. So they are annual, so they're gonna come back every year from seed. It's really one of those, it's a, it's a kind of a weedy plant in that you'll see these are just getting ready to flower. And they'll actually produce this little, they're actually in the aster family, so they produce this little fuzzy looking thing. Mm -hmm. And so it blows in the air, and of course it ends up, you know, in your garden or wherever it might be. Uh, luckily, they are pretty easy to pull out, but they are annuals. Your biggest thing, if, whenever you have an annual plant, whether it's a weed or whatever, you're just trying to make sure it doesn't keep going is make sure it doesn't go to flower and set seed because if they're annuals they have to come back every year from seed so your biggest thing to do is just don't let them go to seed even if you just cut these off you can't get the whole plant out but just cut these off and get rid of them and make sure they don't reseed themselves so that's really important if you're really trying to control them so I put the a little weedy but you know it's not it's not one of those plants that I would worry about you know tremendously taking like taking over everything because usually you can do a pretty good job of sort of controlling it it's easy to pull out even as a big plant and I just thought I'd just mention a few things and we get a lot of questions about plant identification mm -hmm. and yes. and I know it's very very confusing because sometimes you'll see this plant it just sort of, sort of pops up and that now what do I do kind of thing so certainly asking experts can help uh, no, certainly don't American trust Gardener <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Mid American Gardener uh, Mid American Gardener but also your master your local master gardener mm -hmm. group uh, your extension office wherever it might be uh, ask uh, questions but probably the big thing and one of the great things that Sue Ellen did was that she told us where the plant is because yes. that's so that important like yeah. tell us yes. is it in a garden mm -hmm. is it in a roadside uh, you know do you think you planted it because sometimes we have you know perennials or annuals and stuff that reseed themselves it's yes. stuff we actually bought yes. but now it's reseeded itself so so much of it can help us there's certainly plenty of books that are out there mm -hmm. I think one that I really like is this identifying weeds in Midwestern turf and landscapes this is a U of I extension publication and it is so nice because it's a little one you just sort of flip through it uh, and it is the common one it's not gonna be every single one but it's a it, most of the common ones are going to show up in here and that really helps a lot compared to you know going through a giant you know book like this and like flipping through all the pages gets really hard so mm -hmm. you know you know check out a few references and go from there but we're always always happy to help right don right <laughs> Got him. Okay. Got me. And Don, uh, you brought a show and tell yes. also. What are we going to be talking about? Zinnia. 
Okay. I brought some zinnias because there's lots of them around. I drive by a planting every day that was just loaded with powdery mildew and some other things. Unfortunately, they ripped it out. But I did get some. This is a combination of alternaria leaf spot and bacterial blight. And this plant's been hurt pretty bad. And here you can see some leaves. Uh, you can see all the dead area, the black. Now what happens with zinnias, there's about a hundred different cultivars. So there's a lot of them. They, there are a number of species of zinnia. Uh, a, lot, just a lot of the cultivars come from one species. But there's also some crosses between species. Mm -hmm. Now as I started looking, I thought, okay, I would like to know where I can find zinnias that have green leaves and a flower that I can tolerate. But I looked on the internet and Dr. Google didn't really help me a lot and uh, I ended up getting all kinds of commercials on zinnias. So it occurs to me that if you really want to look and decide what variety of zinnia or anything else you want, you might want to consider going to gardens supported by extension, uh, particularly like things like the Idea Garden, Lincoln Avenue, just south of Florida Avenue on Urbana. And there you have lots and lots and lots of flowers. They're named, they're identified, and you can go through and just decide which things you would like to buy for next year. They've got one section that's a trial garden, it's proven winners and things like that. So it's a wonderful place to figure out what you would like, get things with green leaves, and you know, I know <laughs> that you probably want a flower that's not quite this color, but you could live with it if you got green leaves. So. <laughs> So do some window shopping before yeah, window shopping. Yeah. you put them in, that way you can see. Because it's, it's more well. than just a flower. Sure. Yes. Sure. That's exactly okay. right. Okay. Marianne, you brought some... Grasses. grasses. Ornamental grasses, yes. yes. Uh, part of the design thing. I, I really love texture and color in the garden. And I, I think right now, uh, this time of the summer, so grasses, ornamental grasses are just stunning. They, I, I say they, this is when they strut their stuff. But <laughs> this is the inflorescence, the, the, the top, the, the, the plume, what everybody calls the plume of the, of the grasses. Um, there's miscanthus, there's panicum. I love panicums. They, they turn a beautiful golden, um, just gorgeous. The, everybody knows this one. This is Calamagrostis. But that's not how they know it. They know it as Carl Forrester. Right. Everybody knows Carl Forrester. Everybody wants Carl Forrester. <laughs> Very stunning grass, but it's a beautiful dark green blade. And then this just stands straight up and down. It's just fabulous. Um, I have. This is maybe one of my very favorite um, miscanthus, or I'm sorry, panicum, but it has it has a very mm -hmm. beautiful coloration, not only to its inflorescence but also to its blade. It has that it's beginning this time of year. It begins to get this coloration, but the best part of it, well, that's beautiful color. That's that's really great, mm -hmm. but. The name of it is Hot Rod. Now, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I've purchased more than one plant because of the name, and th that's one I would I think definitely, you're all yeah. Of that one. <laughs> we, I would definitely do get that one. Um, you know, this ones that I love these. We used to have all, all sorts of uh, names for these kinds of little inflorescence, inflorescence, but penicillums have this beautiful little bottle brush type. Uh, thing going on and that really has a great texture and just great color. Mm -hmm. There's one called Redhead that gets even darker, almost black. I just love, love, love that. Um, and, and this guy, it's um, Shizatrum, little blue stem. And this is just not quite getting its thing going on, but pretty close. Mm -hmm. But no coloration, different coloration in the leaves and in the, the, the plume. Um, great thing to have in the, in the summertime. Not only just the foliage, because the foliage is fabulous on these plants, but also when they start to do their bloom. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And we were talking before the show that, you know, I've seen people use these in centerpieces at weddings. Oh, gosh, and, yes. Um, backdrops for photos and things like that. Absolutely, so there's absolutely. There's so much you can do with them. And, you know, you, you, you can drive through this town, any town now, you see ornamental grasses everywhere, mm -hmm. and boy, I'll tell you what, people just stop and look at them. They have a nice motion in the mm -hmm. wind, and just add an awful lot to your garden, and, and your landscape, not just a personal garden, but even public landscapes. It's beautiful, a nice thing to use. Excellent, excellent.
Excellent. All right, all right. Uh, Sandy, we're gonna go back to you. Sue wrote in, she's got a Facebook question, and she says, I purchased a lot of iris from several online sellers, and now the rhizomes are starting to arrive. My first one arrived the mid of July, and they're going to continue to come until the end of August. I live in central Illinois, and it is way too hot to plant them. How do I, or how can I store them until it is safe? Well, good news, Sue. <laughs> Plant them. Yay! <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, I think it is one of the things that's very confusing sometimes because mm -hmm. we always think about planting perennials in the spring. In the spring. Or fall, yeah, fall. Or like yes. September. And so we think like, oh, it's got to be too hot for these. But irises, these rhizomaceous irises, they love the heat. They're just fine with heat. Uh, and so this is actually the perfect time. And this would be the time we'd actually even recommend if people were going to transplant and divide them. We generally do it in July and August. That's the right. part of the year. Mm -hmm. um, because that rhizome actually has a tendency to rot um, in that kind of spring and fall time when it's mm -hmm. really cool. Um, so it's re and, and often wet. So this is actually the perfect time, Sue. So it may not be the perfect time for you because it's kind of hot. <laughs> uh, but go ahead and plant them. Absolutely. And, and usually most of the you know reputable companies and stuff, they'll ship them at the correct time for your mm -hmm. area. Yes. That isn't always true. That's but true, most but of the time they're pretty good. So that's why they shipped them to you this time of year because this is exactly the time you need to be going ahead and, and planting them. Yep. So, okay. so go for it. And remember on the irises, you're not going to plant them deep. Um, by exactly. the time you plant them, you're going to see uh, you're going to see really kind of the top part of that little rhizome is actually going to be visible. So just make sure you know there's probably directions with them, but just make sure you don't plant them too deep. That's probably the biggest thing. Is, okay, so get them, right. plant them, get them out Absolutely. there. Yay. All right, quick uh, housekeeping item I want to mention real quick. Following our show last week, we heard from a viewer in Decatur on the subject of vole trapping. They recommended uh, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources website as a place to find more information about that. So many thanks to uh, for reminding us of that resource and we'll share it on our web um, throughout the program and we'll also go ahead and link it to our website just want to get that little housekeeping item out there for you okay so don we're moving on to you for our next round uh, mrs Payne writes in and she says my tree in our front yard has black knot disease it still buds and flowers and then the leaves turn purple and drop in the fall is there anything we can do to save it or does it need to come down Okay, black knot is a disease that occurs on plums and cherries. Uh, this is one of my photographs. Uh, the name of the, the fungus is Dibotrium morbosum. You get that morbid look on it. Uh, <laughs> basically what happens, that gall interrupts the movement of food materials out the stem. So you're gonna have to cut the gall off six or seven inches towards the main stem and get rid of the disease. And a lot of times you'll have smaller galls that you may not see. Now, if you got a lot of this, you're going to be pruning the heck out of the plant. It's just going to be, you'd be better off making one cut right at the very base <laughs> and Yikes. do it away with it. <laughs> if Yikes, you want right. <laughs> uh, plums and cherries, there are resistant plums and cherries. They're not immune, but they have a good level of resistance, and you can find those. Uh, in a number of websites, so you might want to go with that. But if you're getting uh, the plant starting to lose its leaves and all that kind of stuff, I don't think you got a chance with this thing. Okay, so let's soften that up just a little. Uh, <laughs> Good news, Don. <laughs> well, so, if I knew where it was, at think... one time I would have loved to have gotten a hold of it and made it into plant samples for class. Yeah. So <laughs> there is a chance that the tree is salvageable? If I'm just trying when they to find cut, that when they cut all the galls off, <laughs> when they cut the galls off, uh -huh. all the stems with galls about six inches back towards the main stem. Okay. And whatever's left, and they're gonna have to do this for several years. You're better off pruning in the winter time. Okay. Uh, the fungus uh, that produces spores in the spring, and the first year the gall is very small, so you really don't know for sure that it's mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So, Until it's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah, it gets to be a problem. If, if you're noticing the, a lot of it on a tree, you're better off just finding another kind of tree. Okay. So is this one that's really important to make sure that you sterilize the tools in between cuts? Or no, I, not I don't so much on this I, one. I wouldn't worry wouldn't about that, no. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, fingers crossed you're able to salvage the tree. Um, all right. Rich sends in an email and he says, I have some blue rug ferns, possibly a type of evergreen, that are covering an area. Is it possible to transplant some of it to a completely different area if I wanted to? If so, what procedure would you use to transplant part of it as not to damage what I currently have? And when would be a good time? 
Well, Tanisha, I got to tell you, I was really excited about this. I'm a plant collector, and I'm thinking, blue rug fern, this is exciting. I got to have <laughs> one of these. But then I looked at the picture, and what it is is a juniper. Oh, um, okay. So it's a blue rug juniper, very, very common, great, great ground cover. They just, they just, well, from the photograph, you can see it, it really does cover the ground quite nicely. Mm -hmm. um, grows very low. They're usually about uh, five, six, seven inches tall. But they can grow about eight feet wide, oh, eight wow. to ten feet wide. So if you have a big space and a lot of people with a, uh, a kind of a slope and they need to yes. control the erosion, pff, great stuff. Loves the sun. Not real particular about the uh, conditions of the soil, but just doesn't like to sit in water. But um, they're great plants. But it is definitely a, a blue rub juniper, which is green. 12 months of the year. Well, in theory it is. So, <laughs> I mean, we, we have drought. You, you have to be reasonable. Absolutely. Things happen. Absolutely. <laughs> I always like to add, but anyway, um, is it possible to transplant some of the plant? Well, yes it is. Um, probably doing cuttings would be the most appropriate thing to do, the softwood cuttings. Um, there's there's bunches of YouTube things and and, and books and and, mm -hmm. and ways that I mean I can I can tell you pretty quickly but you know stri strip the bottom of the stem a five or six inch long stem um, at the end of, of the of the branches um, so it's soft so that's important mm -hmm. um, strip off the the uh, foliage. Uh, Stick it in some uh, root horn, rooting hormone. Use a, a seed starting mix. You have to tint them to uh, create that greenhouse environment. So it, it isn't that complicated, mm -hmm. but it does take time. So it, it'll start rooting in two or three months. And if you start that now, which is just fine, you can have a rooted cutting to put out in the spring. Okay. It, uh, with it, it, you would of course transplant it into maybe a, a potting mix and some kind of larger container, but uh, that's the way to do that. If you're just moving the entire plant, that's a little different. You want to probably wait till it cools off a little bit um, into our falls. Mm, mm -hmm. I, I say September-ish, and perhaps um, make sure that you're lifting it because those little tiny branches they'll send out little little roots to, to hold themselves in place. Um, mm -hmm. So you're, you're going to have to very carefully uh, get to the main root system so that's that's probably a little more tricky and, and just a huge amount of work but very possible but that would something I would probably do um, in the fall if I had to move the entire plant okay but you can always you mentioned some YouTube videos and oh, again yeah, reach some great, out to great stuff online um, all sorts of books that you can um, get a hold of to show it, it's kind of nice to have a visual uh, yes. of, of, of the process that's yes. why YouTube is so good because there'll be somebody actually showing you the process and I think that's important I mean not everybody knows how big of a hole to dig or yes. how, how long do I cut and how how soft does that need to be and uh, there's so many small questions that um, a picture speaks a thousand words. So. Yep. And if all else fails, contact your local extension office. That's it. There Absolutely. You go. Okay. All right. Quick podcast promo. Episode 15 of the Mid American Gardener podcast is now available. In this episode, Victoria completely bugged out with retired <laughs> entomologist and one of our amazing panelists, Phil Nixon. So you can check that out at our website, um, Stitcher, and the NPR One app. All right, we're going back to round three of our questions. And Sandy, this one's for you. Rose writes, we saw this plant along the side of a country road and it had many monarch butterflies on it. It's about three feet tall. Can you tell us what it is? It was the only one there amongst the other weeds. Thank you, and we never miss the show. Oh, nice. that's awesome. Nice. Yes. Well, it's nice that they're so observant. Yes. Uh, that's a great thing. But this actually looks like a swamp milkweed. So it's, you know, as we know, as mm -hmm. a lot of people know, um, uh, monarchs will only lay their eggs on milkweeds. And I think typically people only think of the common milkweed that has that big wide leaf and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the one that we might see along roadsides. But there are a number of milkweeds that are native, and certainly swamp milkweed is one of those. Um, with its name, you would, um, you would think it needs like a really wet area. Mm -hmm. It does okay in a garden, but I notice it definitely does better on if it's moist. So this is a plant that you can actually purchase. Uh, there are, I think there's a couple of different cultivars. It, this is typically a, as a pink flower. I think there's one that has a white flower, ice yes. ballet, or I think there's a couple of them that actually have, if you actually wanted to purchase it. But it's actually a great garden plant. They get a little tall. Yes. Um, they're probably more in that three and a half to four 
foot. Exactly. I mean, they really, depending on how much moisture they'll get, they'll get a little bit taller. So I just think it's a great plant for kind of that back of the border mm -hmm. in a little full sun for the most part, and then uh, fairly moist. Uh, they don't seem to do real well if it gets like super dry, but it's a great plant to have for monarchs and other, you know, butterflies, and but it'd be a great one to have in your own garden. So it's nice that Rose is so observant and then ask. Yeah. So Absolutely. that's how you find out those things. I've heard a lot of people this summer say that they've seen more butterflies yes. than they have in a very long time. I think that's And I right. don't know if we're doing things better or <laughs> if they like us more or if we're, you know, I don't know, but I've heard a lot of people yeah. say, I have noticed a ton of butterflies this summer. You know, I'm working in retail. I have people come in practically every day asking for the Asclepias, the, the milkweeds. Mm -hmm. um, and there's several different species on the market. You know, the orange one, everybody loves mm -hmm. the orange one, the tuberosa, um, the incarnatus. There's just, there's just several available. But a lot, the, the important thing is a lot of people are asking. Yes. So that's really a good thing. And, and the introduction of, of um, pocket gardens, po mm -hmm. po pocket pollinators. Po Say <laughs> that pollinator pack, right? Yeah, right. Get it, get it in order <laughs> first. <laughs> Too many keys. But that, that's something yeah, that, that I think Master Gardens came right, up with. Right, it's right. Great. And I think the one thing that, you know, sometimes we just forget that, you know, these plants that we have for, you know, for pollinators or bees or whatever, they're also beautiful plants. Yes. So you don't have to give up on the beauty of your garden just because you want to help out the pollinators or butterflies or whatever. Exactly. So I think that's probably the one thing to keep in mind too. So yeah, awesome. great. Absolutely. Good okay. question, Rose. All right, Don, we're going to go to you. Bill writes, I have several peonies and they are healthy plants and produce beautiful blooms. However, after they bloomed, they seem to get a mildew-like covering. This is the second year this has happened. Is there a reason to be concerned? Okay, uh, on peonies, what you have is you have botrytis blight, and this is not a peony right here on the, the screen. You have botrytis blight and that'll do some real damage on uh, foliage. Yes, it is. It is a peony. It is a, oh, there we go. That's the one that I'm looking for. <laughs> That's oh, the you diseased one. You, uh, you wanted the diseased one. one. Yeah, okay. okay Get now, the what, healthy one off the screen. Oh, so what you see here, <laughs> this photograph, you've got botrytis blight. That's that black <gasps> tissue. And that can cause some problems. Uh, then you have mildew. It's a powdery mildew. It's a white growth on the surface. Now, what happens, you don't see powdery mildew when you have peonies out in the open in a field. And Mary Ann can tell you that more than I can. It <laughs> didn't. Clem's Nursery, they just didn't have that in the field of peonies. But what will happen, you plant it around your house, the air movement is not as good, and you'll get powdery mildew. What happens, this fungus needs high humidity to germinate the spore. And no free water. The spores will actually explode in free water. So you need high humidity and for a period of time and it germinates and penetrates. Then the fungus just grows on the surface of the leaf. So really what it does is it just causes shading. So it's not really all that damaging. Now I realize that you don't have a nice green leaf, <laughs> but it's a pretty white. So, <laughs> so uh, you know. Just go with it. Just go, yeah, go with it. And you really have to. There's fungicide that you can buy. It'll take care of it. You said you're from West Virginia? Yes. I heard when you said high humidity. Yeah, well, yeah. it was high, high, <laughs> high humidity. Really high. I heard, I heard the West Virginia right there. I can, do, I can speak hillbilly if I really need. <laughs> A bilingual. <laughs> <laughs> and this actually is one other one, just what you were talking about too. This is actually a good time to check and see, because there are some that are resistant. Oh, to, yeah. oh yeah. To some of these Absolutely. diseases. And so this is a good time to also be checking like peonies mm -hmm. to see which ones are resistant. That's exactly I know at right. Allerton Park in Monticello, it's actually a great place to go. They have a peony garden that they put in and they redid all their peonies. And mm -hmm. so the nice thing is you can, a lot of them are the newer ones. Yes. Um, and you can see which ones are resistant. So this would be a great time to even go there, even though they're not in flower right now. You can go there if you're deciding to buy yeah, peony is exactly. a great time to go through someplace like Allerton and find out you know which ones that you like and well yeah they're not in flower but you know what we live with the foliage a lot yep. more than right. we live with the flowers right. so um, de deciding on a plant isn't just about the flower the, mm -hmm. it's a, it's you got to think long term if you don't like the foliage I'm sorry you just shouldn't yeah, have that in your garden that's a very it, good point to consider peony, <laughs> peony. <laughs> no. all right last question speed round for you yeah David okay. writes in I just bought 17 acres of land and plan on having a nice garden next year is there anything I can do this year to prep 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is, I'll, I'll try to be quick, but this is one of my favorite topics. You should always have a, an extra bag of manure in your in your potting shed. Um, <laughs> composted cow manure, composted horse manure, or your own kitchen compost, whatever it is, have compost. This is what you want to do, is is have your compost ready. He's They've just purchased this property. Figure out sun and light patterns mm -hmm. on the property. Figure out water movement on the property. If there's a space that, that um, holds water, you probably don't want to have your garden there. You know, if you're, I don't care if it's a, a, an ornamental flowers, I don't care if it's vegetables, those things should be um, looked at and decided. And then you start laying out your, your garden bed, to, the, the size of it, the way you need it. And then you start tilling it up, getting rid of all of any, if there's turf or, or whatever's there, um, getting that up and then incorporating compost, 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 compost. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's great stuff, especially we have great soil, but loosening up with compost is, is perfect. Getting it all ready for yes. next year. Question for you on, on the, along that same vein, do you, Test the soil first, or do you wait and see if something perhaps doesn't grow well, and then test the soil? What do you? What's the order there? What well, would you guys do? I, I think by and large we have pretty good soils around here, and mm. there's there's not there's mm. probably pockets of problems, but mostly soil tests are to me are something that happens after you have on a problem. On the back end, yeah. got it. Everybody concur on that? Yeah, I do. Although I will say, you know, if it's a brand new garden and you have that that luxury of they're thinking ahead, yes, which exactly. for me is a luxury because I never think ahead. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. Uh, what you it might be do. a good place to start, especially if you know you're going to oh, grow sure. something like yeah. blueberries or zellias, something like that. It never okay. hurts. All right, great. Thank you guys so much for sure. coming in. Thank you for tuning in with us again this week, and we will see you again next week. Also, just a quick thing: we are going to be at the Urbana Farmers Market next. Next Saturday, yes, next Saturday we'll be at the Urbana Farmer's Market uh, for a two-hour road show. We'll have some panelists there to answer any of your questions, so please stop by. Thanks for watching. Good night. <laughs>